Phil. Thank you for having me finally. Yes, it's really cool. And it's very awesome to be speaking at uh, like my home chapter, so I know a bunch of you already, which is really rad. So uh, I want to get into curiosity with us today. Who here has never been kissed? So we can sort you out pretty quickly. <laughs> like, uh, oh, that's what. Can any of the ladies or guys just help out there? Um, any volunteers? <laughs> so, uh, what, what is the first thing that you do when you kiss somebody? Will you actually like, kiss somebody, like proper kiss, not like your aunt or something, like proper kiss? <laughs> like, you close your eyes, somebody said, you close your eyes, right? Unless you're one of those people who are looking for a better option, and you're like, kind of... <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to take this as like a 6 out of 10, I think I could do better, but... You close your eyes. Right, so the reason that we do this, this is fascinating to me, so the reason that we do this is uh, because our eyes tend to like grab information. They're quite violent in a way. You cannot really choose what you see. Um, you, so for example, everybody that watched the first episode of Game of Thrones, can you remember? Yeah, you will never forget that, even though how much you try. You can't forget it. You always see those two people in the tower. So um, some things cannot be unseen and some things should not be Googled. So, um, <laughs> your, your, um, your eyes grab information, but the rest of your senses are actually quite subtle. So, your, the sense of smell and sense of touch and just your intuition is actually very, very subtle. And we close our eyes when we experience something intense, like kissing, or when we want to memorize something, or when we are really distraught or depressed, you actually close your eyes it's almost to block out that sense and just experience the rest of the emotion that's happening in you. So to block out this very violent sense. And um, at the moment in our culture, we live in a super, super, super visual culture. I'm sure most of you know, and this being a design academy, like a super, super visually obsessed culture. I mean, word of, word of the year a couple of years ago was the emoji. This one, which is not my favorite. I, my favorite is the butterfly at the moment. I don't know. I tend to like... Gravitate. I don't know why, I just like it. It's blue and it's, I think it's cool. So, um, the, and we've sort of regressed in this weird way back to hieroglyphs. Like we're talking in, talking in little emojis and pictures. There was even a Bible translation released the other day that was just made in emojis. They did Genesis 1 or something just with emojis, which is kind of rad. And there was a press release, I think it was Toyota, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, did a press release completely in emojis. Like there was no words and then people read it and understood it, what they were saying about their new vehicle. So we live in this culture that is completely, completely visually obsessed. And uh, of course, Instagram, everybody's favorite, all the hipsters favorite, um, just fueling this visual culture. Like it's growing, it's a past Twitter a couple of years ago, Twitter is sort of stagnating, trying images, not really working. Uh, Barbie style is one of my favorite accounts, I like following it. It's so completely ridiculous. <laughs> you actually just have to like, do yourself a favor. She's got, almost, she's got like two million followers. And she goes out with friends and like, takes selfies. And, like, the, and she's always like, styled to a T. Like, she's fabulous. So, um, so we have this very, very deep obsession and love of images in the, at the moment. So just some Instagram stats, the latest ones. 500 million people on it every day. 500 million people. That's like 10 times the amount of people in our country that's on Instagram every day taking pictures of their cappuccinos or, you know, <laughs> taking, I can never, like, the selfie culture is like, so, so interesting to me. Like, selfies, I mean, self-portraits, you can argue, has been in culture forever. Van Gogh, Rembrandt, they've been, like, the first selfie takers. But now, you're like, you get these girls, somebody please explain this to me. Why do you need your face and your bum in the same shot? <laughs> like, and how do you even bend like that? You see these girls with the, I was like, what the hell? So anyway, so uh, 250 million daily stories actives, which I don't really get. Like, I don't, I'm not 15, so I don't understand what stories are about. <laughs> so very obsessed, image-driven culture. So um, the amount of pictures that will be taken this year? 1.3 trillion. How crazy is that? If you print them out, jumbo size, for those of you that have forgotten, you used to be able to take your <laughs> film to like this little place and you get in an hour. Now when you take it to them, they go, we can have this to you in two weeks. <laughs> okay. So um, 1.3 trillion, if you print them out, jumbo size, they go to Saturn and back. Every year, so every year. So estimated that on servers everywhere in the world, there's about 13 trillion images that are being stored. Can you imagine all that data, like all those data centers that are just storing 
selfies, cappuccino images, somebody's nudes. Like it's <laughs> mind-boggling. So just to like just to compare, this this is the amount of pictures at the height of film, right? 2000, the height of film. This was the amount of pictures that were taken, 85 billion. So just to compare that, I like little data visualizations. So every single dot is a million, right? So that's the amount of pictures, just like digital pictures that can be taken this year. And those little red dots are at the height of film that were taken, 85 billion. Oh, can you see the red dots? Oh my God, it's in the corner, you can't even see it, see? It's in the corner there. See, I, I didn't go to design college, that's why. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so we have this love affair with the camera. She says, I love this ad. It's so like, ridiculously 70s and sensual and awesome. And she says, j'aime ma camera parce que j'aime vivre. It means, I love my camera because I love life. And then she says, I record uh, the best moments of existence so that I can recall them later in brilliance. <laughs> right? Don't you love it? It's great. So uh, we have this love affair with the image. And, uh, I think as human beings, it, it has to do with what it means to be a human being, to love our, our own images, because we can actually recognize ourselves in a mirror. Like most animals or almost, not, almost nothing else, no animals can recognize themselves in a mirror, except an orangutan, so that, that should tell you something maybe. So <laughs> orangutans can recognize themselves in a mirror and human beings, that's all. And in a way, it's true what she says. It's like, I'm recording existence. And it's a way to know that we exist. Taking a selfie is almost a way to tell yourself that you are real. That you're recording your whole life on Instagram or on stories or Facebook or in your family photo album to say that this actually really happened. Now, um, our love affair with the image, I think to a large extent it has to do with our belief system as well about what we know is true. How do we know that something is true? And we have this little saying that we say, I'll, I'll only believe it, believe it if I see it. see it, right? But our love affair with the image can like, sometimes have a very bad side to it. So at the moment, about 30 to 40 percent, some people say 50, but I think it's a bit much, 30 to 40 percent of food is being thrown away. Totally edible, totally fine food is being thrown away for one reason and one reason only. Do you know why? It's not pretty enough. That's the reason. So we have half the world's going hung hungry and we are throwing half the world's food away at the same time. How does that make sense? All in the name of beauty. All in the name of knowing that the fruit is right. So every time that you go into your local shop or Woolworths or Spot or wherever you shop and you pick a fruit based on its appearance, you share in that system. You help to throw food away. So that's pretty scary. And it's, it just has to do with image. It just has to do with beauty. There was a couple of years ago, there was a supermarché in, um, intermarché, sorry, in France. They did a campaign called the, uh, the in Inglorious Fruits and Vegetables. And they did the grotesque apple, the ugly carrot, the failed lemon. And then what they did is they put them, gave them their own ad campaign, put them on a separate shelf in all the stores, and marked them down 30% from the pretty fruits. And they sold out every single day. Because the ugly carrot is exactly the same as the pretty <laughs> carrot. Like there is no difference. The failed lemon is exactly the same as the other lemon and the grotesque apple is exactly the same. So at least somebody is trying to do something. Being blind, like I, my mother actually used to work for a uh, South African Council for the Blind. And uh, it's one of the most frightening things for most of us, the most frightening sense to lose. Right? If you were to pick, if I had to give you the choice, you know, God forbid we, any of us have to make this choice, but you have to choose between becoming deaf and be, be, becoming blind. Which would you choose? Who would choose deaf, being deaf? I would. Yeah, who would choose being, being blind? Yeah, like a couple, so 10, maybe 10%, 1 or 2% would choose blindness over deafness, right? So here's what's interesting. It didn't always used to be like this. In the Middle Ages or pre-technology, pre-industrial age, it was switched. People feared more becoming deaf than becoming blind. Because if you're deaf it, back in the day or pre-industrial age, you couldn't navigate your world. Because nobody was reading anyway. 
right? Now we interpret our world and we navigate our world through sight. Back then you did it through hearing. So you heard the town crier, you heard the gossip in the streets, you heard the sermon at the cathedral on a Sunday. So you heard everything. So you used your hearing to navigate everything. So inspiration um, in the pre-industrial age, always when you look at those old paintings, you always see the inspiration come in through the ear. Like you see Mary and then the divine inspiration is like, goes right in the ear. It doesn't go in the sight or anywhere else. So um, being blind is the sense that we most fear losing because then we can't navigate and we can't see and then we, can't, we feel that we can't know, right? So I think this knowing or this idea of knowing or this obsession with knowing, this is a guy, uh, Descartes. Does everybody know who Descartes is? So Descartes said very famous here, he said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, that's actually not what he said. He said, I doubt, therefore I am. He actually went and sat on an island and he wanted to know what he could know for sure. So he started doubting every single thing. He started doubting uh, where he came from, where he was born, what he does, his family, his wife, his career. He started doubting the stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, like every single thing he started to doubt. And then he finally came to the conclusion that the only thing that he couldn't doubt was the fact that he was doubting. Right? And that right then and there, somebody should have shot him. <laughs> right? Drag him into the street and off the island and shot him. Because that idea of thinking equates to knowing, or logic equates to knowing, has not served us very well. Or seeing something and knowing something empirically equals knowledge does not serve us very well. Right? And then we have our modern day hero. At least he started to doubt the value of logic. A little bit. Every now and again, his human side actually comes out and he loses his temper, where he falls in love. Some things which can't be known as such. So, we live in a, in a world where we want to know that what we're going to see, we are going to like. Right? So, our world, Facebook and Google and all the others, are designing our knowledge and our experiences based on your likes. Right? Have you ever read that little sign? Based on your likes. You're seeing this based on your likes. So if you're clicking around Facebook and you're clicking pictures of kittens all the time, then guess what, you're gonna, what your feeds are going to be filled with? Right? Kittens. If you're clicking pictures of white supremacy, then guess what your feeds are going to be filled with? Right? Because Google knows about 59 things about you, if I'm not mistaken. And when you, if, if you are a liberal, left-wing person, then when you Google political opinions, it'll give you that. And you think, isn't this incredible? The whole world thinks exactly the way I do. <laughs> this is wonderful. I'm being affirmed. If you're a Trump supporter, then you Google something, then all the positive reviews will come up, right? So a friend of mine the other day, she's like, I went onto this website and was looking at these boots, and they were so fantastic, and I decided, no, they're too expensive. And I just went out of the website, and a couple of weeks later, I went back onto another website, and here was an ad with a boot. I think God is telling me to buy these boots. I was like, no, I don't think it's God telling you to buy these boots. I think it's Google telling you to buy these boots. So everything that we see is curated based on our likes. And we like this because it's safe. As human beings, we like things that we know and already agree with. And especially as creatives, we, we have our little sources, you know, FFF Found or, you know, Pinterest or, you know, yeah, Pinterest weddings. I'm sorry, if I have to go to another Pinterest wedding, like you can actually gauge the Pinterest level of a wedding by the amount of <laughs> wreaths and like console jars they are or something. Like it's so annoying, like please get another, get another reference. So this, um, sorry, I'm like digressing, but a person said, the best definition of Pinterest is when your wife spends eight hours on a phone and then you end up eating salad out of a jar. <laughs> That's what Pinterest is. So um, we always go to the same sources as creatives because it's easy, right? And we always read things, read books, read articles, read magazines that we already know that we're going to like and that we already know that we agree with. And we do this with movies as well. You go to a movie that you already know you're going to like. Right? And then afterwards, we're going to go, oh, Black Panther is going to be amazing. And then you go and see it. Go, that was amazing. It's like, you just wasted like 80 bucks. You knew it was going to be amazing before you went. So, but we do this because it makes us feel safe. Right? But this is not necessarily a very good thing. Because logic and reason, the more crazier the world becomes, the more we want to try and hold it tighter. The more we want to see things. 
the more we want to just um, capture things and capture existence, the more we research them, the tighter we want to try and hold it. But reason, I think we're waking up out of that a little bit as a, as a society, is reason and logic is not the greatest thing in the world. Like the last 150 years since the Enlightenment, right? Photography also means painting, painting with light. So ever since the Enlightenment, enlightenment and the, the rise of logic and reason, we've had like the bloodiest century ever. Because it's very, very reasonable to have to separate people according to race. It's very, very reasonable to have a genocide. It's very, very reasonable to not allow women to vote. It's very reasonable. I can argue, anybody can argue that. So reason and logic is not the be all and end all. And we're discovering that as a people, slowly. And um, fluorescent lighting, right? I, I, I cannot, like I cannot, I cannot with fluorescent lighting. Like it is the, it is the ultimate symbol of modernity and the enlightenment, right? All that thinking and all that knowledge and everything ended and it gave us the fluorescent light. <laughs> it is the worst thing. If you've ever tried taking a picture, in the, it's the, everybody looks horrible. <laughs> like why they put them in change rooms, nobody knows. Like it's the worst thing. It makes you look like you're on some like autopsy table. There's no shadow. There's no nuance. It's the worst thing in the world, right? Whoever invented it should be dragged into the street as well, along with the cart, and just shot shortly Slowly. after him. It is the worst thing. Slowly. Slowly. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's so reasonable and cost effective and logical. But it's not beautiful and it's not interesting and it's not unexpected and there's no nuance and no shadow. And then we expect, we shove people into little cubicles and then we expect them to be really, really creative. Right? Innovate. <laughs> so it doesn't work. That's not, where, that's not where innovation happens. It's not where it's found. Like, where do you find treasure? In a brightly lit room on a table, like under some fluorescent lighting with neon signs going, here it is. Going, no, it's not there. It's in the shadows. Like it's always behind a wall and underneath a rock. You have to work to get there. You have to get lost a little bit and then you find it. There's a story of... Um, Friends of ours had this really old house, 100 years or more, and uh, eventually you had to go up into the, into the ceiling, and it's dusty. We also live in this massively old house, and uh, it's very dodgy and scary to go up into the ceilings. And like, there's like skeletons of rats and somebody's grandmother and like, things <laughs> up there. And he was digging around and trying to fix something, and he found this little purse, this little velvet purse. And when he came down, they opened it, and there was like old Krugerrands in there. That somebody, and there was so much that they could pay off their house. How cool is that? But the lesson being, if you never go into the dodgy, dingy spaces where you don't like to be and go dig around there, you'll never find the gold. As simple as that. Like in uh, Japanese culture as well, like patina on silver is valued. Because you can't create it. It's unpredictable. It grows. It takes time. So I've got this in our house, I have this like little patina, little garden. So I've got like old silver trophies and things that I find at like Milton Market or wherever. And then I just leave them. And our poor cleaning lady, she, does, she doesn't understand why <laughs> she's not allowed. And she did, she, she took initiative, <laughs> right? And cleaned all my silver and I freaked out. I was like, why did you clean my silver? <laughs> now all the patina's gone. Now it has to like restart again and shame. So, um, <laughs> so, but I think it secretly, you know, we all, we love mystery. We're all very enlightened and logical and reasonable, but secretly we love mystery. I know that we do, because we all, I put mine away, but we all carry these little black rectangles around with us, right? And almost none of us know how they work. You have no idea. Like the first time one of you, when you had got your first smartphone or whatever, that's the most incredible thing. You're going, you just touch the screen and it like wakes up. You just lift it and it wakes up. It's like, how does it work? I don't know. It's awesome. Because okay. we love magic. We love magic. And we love that we don't know. Because I tend to think that as human beings, we, we, we need that. We need a little bit of mystery. And we need to not know. So in Praise of Shadows, there's this great article. It's by a Japanese architect, like written in the 30s or 40s, uh, about Japanese aesthetics. You go find it online. Just Google it. In Praise of Shadows. And it talks about how the importance is the things that are not known in design. The things that you don't know where they come from. Exploring the unknown, the uncertainty. And we need that. 
We, need, we all need mystery in our, in our lives. You see, one of the worst forms of torture is white room torture. But they place you under fluorescent lighting, <laughs> yeah, in a white room with white bed, white linen, put you in white clothes, you get like soft pantoffles, and they give you white food on white paper plates, and they never turn off the lights, and then after a couple of days you go insane. Because you can, and the reason is you can no longer distinguish between what is inside and what is outside. So you don't have a place to hide. We don't have a place to hide all the secrets and everything you know that's come stumbling out. And some of the people that have experienced this say that it's one of the worst forms of torture that there is. White room torture. Shadows are romantic. Like the essence of romance, Oscar Wilde, you have to quote Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde said the essence of romance is uncertainty. Like not knowing. Like not know will she, won't she? Will he, won't he? Like not knowing. And Nobody puts a fluorescent light on a table when you're like having a romantic dinner going, you know what, <laughs> I just, re you candlelight, candlelight, that's what you want, candlelight, you want candlelight at the dinner table, you want candlelight in the bedroom because everybody looks good in candlelight, <laughs> right? You want shadow, you want uncertainty, that's what you want. And romance, if there's romance in your life, if there's uncertainty, there's romance, if there's romance, then that will lead eventually to life. No romance. No babies, no life, right? No romance in a business, no romance in your life, no romance in your career, no romance, no uncertainty, no life. Very easy. Um, one of my favorite architects, Peter Zumthor, he designs in a very weird way. He designs by using senses other than sight, although his buildings are very beautiful. When you walk into one of his spaces, it feels like you've been there before because he uses textures from your childhood and familiar scents and feels. So if you, just by opening one of his doors, it feels like you've been there already. He designs in a way beyond sight, which is actually very interesting. The art of getting, of going for a walk. I call myself a flaneer, because a flaneer is a man who saunters around the city observing society. Right? It's either that, so it existed in the, the 17th, 18th century France, Paris. So it's that, and it's also like an old man sitting in a cafe looking at girls. <laughs> so <laughs> those are the two definitions. And uh, being a flaneer is about the importance of walking. Because cities, this is a new app called WalkScore, and it's not about finding a nice place to eat, it's about actually finding a place to live. But it's all rated on the walkability of the place that you buy. And a city like Cape Town, at least in the bowl, like, it's a very walkable place, which is also why it's so expensive to live here, right? And the more walkable the place is, the more expensive it will be in the future. And getting lost is a gift. Getting lost and being curious. So, uh, we have this, uh, I'm going over a little bit of time, but um, we were in Paris a couple of years ago, my wife and I, just before we had our first, our daughter, and uh, we had, like, no money. Such a hashtag, white privilege, no money in Paris. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so we were walking around looking for a cheap place to eat and ended up, we saw this little bistro and thought, Psh, how expensive could it be? Just mistake number one. So we walked into this bistro, beautiful little art deco thing, had like eight tables, nothing is in English, not even the menu, nobody, there's like one waiter. And uh, we ended up drinking so much wine and eating things that were piled up in little towers and blowing something like 300 euros on a, on a meal, <laughs> which was about 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago now, which is like crazy. So, but it's the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful memory, because you got lost. So what if, what if, like when you're doing research, you go to places where you haven't been before. You add things into your life randomly on purpose to create like this little randomness. Because that's where the most beautiful creativity comes from. The most beautiful innovation is when you like mush things together that don't belong together. When you find like new little things instead of going to the same old boring websites and the same old boring sources. It's like doing something that is new. Because that's where the, where the innovation lies, where the creativity lies. It's at the edges of the maps. This is an old map before America existed. So pre-Trump. <laughs> so before America existed. But on the edges of the maps, it always said, it always say, here be dragons. I Game of Thrones reference, you have to like have it in every talk. So um, to 
go to the places where the dragons are. To like not go to the easy and the safe places that you already know. To be curious and to go into those places. Because if you don't go there, new worlds will never be discovered. So I want to finish off just with, I always give like a little task. I like giving a little task. So, and it's good to finish off a talk with some nudity. So <laughs> it's not a South African guy, that one. I. Um, in the old Greek gyms, they used to train in the nude, right? Because it's very difficult to do like spinning in a toga. So you used to train in the nude. And um, the, on top of the gym, when you walk into it, it said the words in Greek, not in English, strip or attire. <laughs> Right? So get your skin in the game. That's where that expression comes from. Get your skin in the game. Right? Actually put yourself into it and actually do it. So to actually try. So at every time and every talk and every month we sit here, something pops hopefully of a little light bulb goes up. And if you don't action that within 24 hours, it goes away. The little neuro pathway that just formed goes away. So you need to actually do it. So I'll give you a little task. It's something that we do from time to time just to purposely put some randomness in your life. So the next time you go to a movie, pick the number of the cinema, right? If you know there's 10, then pick a number from one to 10, and then pick it beforehand with a roll of dice you can or however, just randomly. And when you arrive there, the rule is you have to see whatever is watching at number five. Even if it is seven brides with seven dresses or whatever, you have to watch it. <laughs> The, the only, the only like, little addendum is like, if it's a foreign language film with no subtitles, then you can like, pick another one. But otherwise, you have to watch. It doesn't matter what it is. And sitting through, and you have to sit through the whole thing and find something. And I can almost guarantee you that you'll find something. There'll be something in there that you did not know before. There'll be a reference or a visual something that you did not see before. Something that you would not normally go to. Because we all desperately, desperately, desperately need that in our life. So just to finish off, it's like shadows are romantic. Uncertainty is romantic. To be curious is a gift. To get lost is a gift. And to stray away from the known path is a complete, complete gift and an adventure. And that's where it lies. That's where innovation lies. That's where creativity lies. So thank you very much for that.